Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 2, I'll share with you one little thing that happened as I was sitting there. It says, uh, Brother Dave had us turn to Ecclesiastes and started reading. My son Asa looked over to me and said, did you finish Romans? And I said, yeah. He, and he, this was his look. Seems like you've been in that for a long time. Yep. So here we are. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Join me please in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your spirit who opens our eyes to your word, to your truth, to who you are to the glory of Christ, and thank you for the privilege of being able to sing about these things. We want to turn our eyes to our Savior, and yet so often we're distracted by so many things. Help us now in these moments that our eyes would be turned to you as we think through your word and seek to worship you in light of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We have all kinds of entertainment at our fingertips. Whether we want to engage in someone else's drama or some type of mystery, or maybe you are one of those that likes to enter into the mysterious world of science fiction like we did last night watching the second part of the new Thor movie where these people are flying around on axes and throwing hammers that come back to themselves and things like this. Or maybe simply you uh, like your mind set at ease as you just take in a comedy. Uh, these are all ways in which we have a source of endless entertainment to consume our minds and take ourselves away from our actual lives. Uh, this is... Uh, what is offered to us by endless sources like Netflix or Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, and Peacock. The supply of streaming services is endless. And then, of course, in addition to all of that, you have YouTube that has uh, a plethora of opportunities to find both good and false information. Uh, we, we have lots and lots of resources. And you would think that with all of this available entertainment that we would have a happier society. But the studies indicate something completely different than that. Uh, this past week, Pastor Jeff sent along a podcast of uh, this chief of addiction medicine at Stanford University. And as I listened to about, I think, 35 of the 45 minutes of that podcast, there was one statement that stood out as she was talking about the problem of whatever drug of choice, whether it's actual drugs or entertainment drugs that flood our bodies with endorphins, she makes this statement, the relentless pursuit of pleasure actually leads to pain. She proposes from a research standpoint that video games and other forms of entertainment which flood our bodies with dopamine cause the normal parts of life, like your Monday, it's coming. It, cause it causes it to seem so dull, unimpressive, and useless. And with that sense, there is the ripple effect of purposelessness boredom, and even depression. So this comes from a, a sociologist, someone who's studying human minds and human behaviors and the, the results of our choices. And I don't think that Solomon is giving us a different message than this. I think Solomon is telling us a very similar reality that he discovered as he tested his heart very interesting expression. I tested my heart. <laughs> um, 
as we look through Ecclesiastes 2, these first 11 verses, I think we're going to find that Solomon is warning us that while pleasure has a good place in our lives, and I want to make sure that we don't lose that uh, reality, pleasure does have a good place in our lives, and God is not anti-pleasure by any means. If we seek wellness, wholeness, and satisfaction through pursuits of pleasure, we will come up empty, frustrated, and broken. Let's take a look, please, at Ecclesiastes 2. Our brother David already read it once. We're going to read it one more time, then we'll work our way through it. Ecclesiastes 2, beginning in verse 1. God's Word says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools for which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, it was all vex, uh, vanity, excuse me, it was all vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Wow. He starts off by talking to himself. Now, Robert, <laughs> I will test you with pleasure. <laughs> Solomon, I will test you with pleasure. I'm going to find out just how far I can press these things to find what I ultimately thought I needed. And as he did this, he comes to verse 11. We're going to work our way through, but he comes to verse 11 and he says, this was so elusive. It's like trying to grab the smoke and I can't do it. But then he opens up another word picture for us by talking about... Uh, the striving after wind. And when we went through the book of Ecclesiastes the last time, I had a way for us to try to understand this striving after the wind. And so I want to paint this picture for you to think about, okay? Are you ready? I don't, I don't think I did this last week, so I'm going to do it all over again. I want you to picture you're at your back deck and you have your grill and you open the top lid and you're either cooking a big fat burger or a veggie burger or a black bean burger or whatever your variety of burger is. There you are. You're cooking it. And, and it's, it's coming out. You've got it seasoned just right. You love this burger. You tenderly take care of it. You make sure you don't overcook it. You don't undercook it. It's going to be, for me, medium rare or medium, but definitely not medium plus. Definitely not medium well. And please, no hockey pucks. We've, we've got it. It's, it's just right. We have just the right bun, whatever your special. You like a potato bun. You like a, a ciabatta bread. I don't know what your thing is, but you've got it. It's there. Burgers on it, perfectly cooked, perfectly seasoned. You throw on a slice of cheddar or whatever your variety of cheese is. 
If you like pig like I do, you put some bacon on that thing. Your wife has made a great array of sautéed onions and mushrooms. Throw it on the burger. Put the top on. A little, maybe you do mayonnaise. I don't know. There it is. Can you see it? Can you smell it? Ready? Take a bite. Right now. How's it taste? Just like air. We call that an air burger. Solomon said, I tried, I tried, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing. I can't quite get a handle on it, and it has come up like this big, fat, juicy air burger. Nothing, nothing. I don't have anything to show for it. It's a sad, it's a sad commentary on this exploitation. However, he did learn a few things. So the first, as we work our way through it, self-indulgent pursuits do not produce purpose. Self-indulgent pursuits do not produce produce purpose. He, he's experienced and explored the purpose of life, tried to explore the purpose of life through wisdom in chapter 1, and he came up empty. Now the preacher, Solomon, moves on to explore meaning through pursuits of pleasure and self-indulgence. One writer, uh, Douglas O'Donnell, writes, within the house of hedonism, that's a pursuit for pleasure, within the house of hedonism, there are many rooms. And he's going to try to enter into all of these rooms in this Little investigation. First, he tries comedy. Verse 2, I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? You know, we do enjoy a laugh, don't we? I like laughing with people. I like laughing at things that come on the TV or the little videos that people send me. GIFs memes, all these kinds of things. They're, they're fun. Um, some. Some go beyond the borders of my sensibilities. But I like to laugh, don't you? I like to watch comedic things that are appropriate. I, I think it's great. It's healthy. Um, laughter does do good like a medicine. And so that's a good thing. But laughter does not take away the source of our pain. And if we try to cover up the source of our pain with laughter, eventually you're going to stop laughing and you're still going to be stuck with the source of pain. So Solomon said, I, I said of laughter, of all this comedy, I have the best comedy available to me, but then I still come back to reality and it's still a frustration. And it's still elusive. And it's still hurts. So he doesn't just try laughter. He moves on from comedy and he tries to, to cheer himself with whatever source of substance he can get. Verse 3, he says, I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. So he's talking about, all right, I'm going to take this substance. I'm going to, I, I feel sorrow, so I'm going to use the bottle. Or I feel sorrow, I'm going to use you know, some, some, something I snort. I, I, I feel sorrow, I'm going to use something I, I inject. I use sorrow, I've got this sorrow. I'm going to cover it up with something. A pill, whatever it is. Maybe momentarily, it eases. Stress builds up, and I think I need a cannabis chewy. But the stress is still there. The stress is still there. It doesn't go away. So the substance doesn't work. He did this, he says, while still maintaining wisdom. So he makes us understand. He's not saying, I went into a drunken stupor and this, this didn't solve it. He says, I, I tried, all, I tried it with, in wise attempts. I, I tried to use this substance and, and it, didn't, it didn't fix me, even, even with wisdom. He tries all manner of foolishness. Look at verse 3. He says, how to lay hold on folly. This is what he tried to do. I tried to lay hold on folly that it might see what, what, what good that would do for the children of men during these few days. He understands the temporality of life, the, the fragility of life. It's just only so long. It's brief. What, what's, what's good to do? Oh, let, me, let me hold on to some, some fun, some good foolishness. That didn't work. Then he tries building structures. Now it's going to be accomplishment. I'm going to be that guy. And I'm going to have these beautiful buildings. I'm going to have my little um, servant quarters back here. My agricultural things over here. 
my, my beautiful lush lawn over here. I'm going to try all these things. Is there anything wrong with building a building? Anyone? No? Anything wrong with having a, 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 a shed? <laughs> we all want a good shed. One, two, five, seven sheds, however many you want. We like sheds, garages, all good. A lush lawn? Is there anything wrong with a plush lawn? No, of course not. Um, if we seek to find our joy there. So let's think about Solomon. Look at verse 4. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. You know, Solomon was uh, used by God to build the temple. That thing was overlaid in gold. Now, I don't know. I don't know who you are. And I don't know what your situation is, but I don't think you could probably overlay your shed in gold. This is a big, giant monstrosity of a temple overlaid in gold. It's incredible. He built his own house. And according to 1 Kings chapter 7 and verse 1, it took, are you ready for this? 13 years to complete his house. My guess is it was bigger than mine. I don't think my house took 13 years to build. Yours? Probably not. He built houses for his wives. How many wives? 700. <sighs> we'll touch on that for a minute in a few moments. He built, according to 2 Chronicles 8, not a city, but cities. His endeavors to build far exceed any of our wildest imaginations. Then he tries landscaping, gardening, and agriculture. What's the best garden that you've ever seen? Can you, can you remember a really beautiful garden that you saw, whether it was a flower garden or a vegetable garden, and it's like, man, that's, that's the envy of the town, right? This, this is the one. I want that garden. Or maybe you can think of a beautiful apple orchard. It's apple picking season. It's apple crisp season, actually, is what it really is. <laughs> Have you been to a beautiful apple orchard, and you're like looking around, and it's just like, this is really, this is, this is like, um, it's nostalgic for some of us, because apple picking is like a yearly thing. But beautiful. Solomon's apple orchards would be off the charts. There are some beautiful farms on the motorcycle route that we take through Connecticut. Um, I think it's on Route 49. Beautiful, lush, beautiful uh, landscape. You can see big sky in that section. Instead of, you know, around here, it's like the sky's encroached by everything that we've got crowded around. Big sky, beautiful lush fields, beautiful farm country. Solomon had all of this times a thousand. <laughs> this is all of his pursuits. He had it beyond anything we could even imagine. He has people serving his every whim in verse 7. I bought male and female servants and had servants who were born in my house. It's like... Every single thing he wants done can be done for him. I, want my, oh, I don't want any, any specks of dust on the floor or on the windowsill, so we've got our, our servants to take care of that. No dust. You want uh, this kind of a meal at this time with this variety. There it is right before you. He had every single thing he could imagine. He has every material possession and everything that money could buy in verses 7 and 8. Um, in 2 Chronicles 9, it talks about Solomon's wealth like this, that the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone. There's a lot of stones around here. If you don't believe me, try to dig a, a, a fence post. See how many stones you come across. There's a lot. If we could monetize stone, none of us would have any money problems, right? You'd be set forever. 
and your children and your children's children to the fifth and seventh and 20th generation after you. But this is how wealthy Solomon was and the community around him was. He has entertainment at his disposal. Now look at verse 8. I, will you read it with me? I got singers. He's not poor in his English grammar. Oh yeah, I got some singers. It's not like that. No, no, no. I obtained singers. I obtained any entertainment that I wanted. You and I, we're simpletons. We go on YouTube Music and it plays the song. We can listen to it over and over again. That's great. Or we buy a CD. Or you buy an MP3. Whatever the thing is, you can listen to it. Solomon's... No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not going to stop at YouTube Music or Apple Music or whatever other uh, streaming music service. I'm just going to obtain the band. Just bring the band to me. I've got the money. Now, whenever I want... Whatever song, I'm going to hear the live version. They're going to do this for me. He owns them. It's pretty impressive as far as capacity. Not only does he have all of these works at his disposal and all this entertainment at his disposal, now he has, he has taken it to a whole other level. Verse 8, I got for me singers, male and female. Uh, men and women, and many, what does it say? Concubines. The delight of the sons of man. According to 1 Kings 11 and verse 3, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Solomon did not spare himself for any variety of sexual pleasure. No variety was a variety he didn't test his heart in. And you know what he found? This ain't working. This is not working. The problem is not all of the experiences. The problem is right here in me. Because Solomon proves that he is just another in a long line of sinners that have come from Adam. You and I are broken, and there's nothing that you and I can do to fix that brokenness. We can test it. I'm going to search down this alley to find satisfaction and pleasure. I'm going to search down this alley to find myself to be complete. I'm going to search down this alley to get my purpose. I'm going to not hold back even one thing from my pursuits. And it might be fun until they're not. might be great until it's not. And let, let's think about this for a minute. Because I'm a peon in comparison to Solomon. There are experiences that I haven't had. So my mind and my heart will say, yes, but you haven't experienced this. That will do this for you. Solomon exhausted all of it, and when he came to the end of it, he said, what in the world is going on? I have tested myself with every imaginable pleasure, and I still find out that I am the same person that I was at the beginning of the pursuit. So that could be very, very discouraging. Or, it could be very sobering and settling and easing because I find out that it's not something that I go do and get that's going to bring some resolution 
to this yearning inside of me. Because Solomon, while he said, I, I, I searched out all these, these pleasures, I didn't hold back any desires, he tells us that he really enjoyed it. It's not like he said, oh, this was all just terrible and I hated every second of the laughter and I hated every second of the wine, I hated every second of the women, I hated every second of the, the, the works of my hand. I hated every... He didn't say that. What he says is, I found pleasure in it and I found out that there are some things that help along life's journey. There are things that are good for a man to do on the, in the short days that he has here. God is not opposed to pleasure. I think it's very important for you and I to understand this, particularly as we come into a church building and churches are renowned for trying to be killed joys. And that is not the God that has created us. I want for you to think about this for just a moment. When God made Adam and Eve perfect and perfectly, and He placed them in a perfect environment, were there a variety of things for them to enjoy in the midst of their experience in the garden? There were. As they looked around, they saw numerous trees bearing numerous kinds of fruit. And they were invited to enjoy God's good creation. Eat! 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 There was only one tree that God said, this is going to hurt you. All of these are good. They're made for you. For you to enjoy so you'll know how much of a variety of a God I am. I'm not boring and stuck. You have only apples. That's it. Apples for you all day long. I hope you enjoy your apple. Apple sauce and apple crisp and apple pie. Apples, apples, apples. That's all you get. No. There are apples and bananas and oranges and coconuts and pineapples. Just go down the list. You know, maybe you like the little pomegranate things that have pomegranate seeds in it. Maybe you're an avocado king. You just eat avocado one thing after the other. Maybe you're like my dad and has a little bit of a hot dog with his onion. Onion is its great variety. It's wonderful. These are all things that God made. And God tells us He gives us Listen carefully to this. God gives us all things richly to enjoy. That is not something that Rob made up. That's from 1 Timothy chapter 6. While God, through Paul, warns of the deceitfulness of riches earlier in chapter 6, he comes back to the riches conversation later in chapter 6, and he says, God has given you this wealth? Do good things with it, including enjoying it. If God has entrusted you with finances, you're allowed to eat some of the fruit of those finances. Did you know that? You don't have to always and only save it for a rainy day. You don't have to always and only save it for your children and the children's children and the children's children after them. You can enjoy it. You can give to others that are in need. You can give to, to the Lord. You have to make your own living. You have to prepare for the future. But God has given you things to enjoy. God is the opposite of against pleasure. He's given our bodies senses to smell. Ears to hear. Mouths to taste. Hands to to feel. He's given us this inexhaustible desire for experiences. And He wants us to experience things. The problem that you and I face, like Solomon, is that we try to take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing and it comes forth like ash in our mouths. We take a good thing, we make it an ultimate thing, instead of a blessing, it becomes a curse. So let's think about that for a moment. God has given us material things to enjoy. 
if we're not careful, we'll cross over the line to being hoarders or covetous or envious of what other people have. God has given us wonderful things to drink. There's a hazard, however, as we crave more and more, well, if this much drink is good, how much better is this much drink? And we can end up in a, in a situation of drunkenness and stupor and, and causing ourselves and our family and other people pain. God has given us things to enjoy. God has given us things like the pleasure of sex for a couple that has been married before the Lord. Those things are wonderful. If, if anyone talks about sex as a bad thing, they don't understand that God has designed sex as a pleasure and fulfillment and a companionship and a union for th those that God has joined together in marriage. However, that good thing can be abused as it's used outside of the marriage bonds. And God calls that fornication or adultery. And you know what that does? It brings harm to your own body your own mind, the body and mind of the person that you're engaging that with, and then a ripple effect of those around you. It causes a world of pain. Something really good that turns into something really bad. God has given us so much to enjoy. We cross over the line from enjoying God's gift to trying to extract more from these gifts than they're capable of providing and we distort these good gifts. Tim Keller made the statement, I kind of alluded to it by how I'm communicating about it. He said, idolatry means turning a good thing into an ultimate thing. Solomon wraps this up by, by saying, don't forget um, that after all of these things that I've tried to pursue, I didn't find in them something to grab onto. Verse 11, I considered all my, that my hands had done and the toil I had experienced or expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind and there was nothing to be, what does it say? Gained under the sun. So Solomon is trying to grab onto life. He's trying to hold it tight. He's trying to get everything he can out of it. And he says, when I grab onto that, there's nothing to grab onto. I try to grab this, take a bite. It's not satisfying. It's not, it's not getting the job done. If he, with all of his resources, can't attain satisfaction from his pursuits of pleasure, what hope does a person that makes $80,000 a year have? to grab onto satisfaction through the pursuit of pleasure? The answer is, there's, there's not any chance. One more party? Your biggest party is less entertaining, less gluttonous, less hedonistic than Solomon's Monday. A bigger house? 13 years, he built that thing. And he was in the same condition he was at at the beginning of that process. All of this he did with wisdom. So he lets us know in the middle of verse 3, my heart was still guiding me with wisdom. And the end uh, uh, of verse 8, also my wisdom remained with me. So as he was testing these things, it wasn't like he was just throwing off all of his thoughts. He was like maybe taking a journal. <laughs> well, I tried that one. Bomp. Tried this one, <laughs> tried this one, nah, not happening, not getting the job done. So his pursuits of purpose were coordinated with wisdom, but that didn't really help. You know, take a look please. I'd like you to, to turn to 1 Timothy 5 for just a moment. There's some really great things that God does in the pastoral epistles, that's 1, 2 Timothy, and Titus. In 1 Timothy particularly, about money. He, he, and pleasure he gives us some warnings. And what I want you to, to see and just for a moment here is biblical wisdom warns us about fleeting pleasures. Now in this section, he's talking about widows, a woman who has lost her husband. 
and the church's care for widows and how to do this. But in the middle of it, there's this, this little contrast that takes place between a widow's having hope in God or trying to exhaust and find meaning in stuff. And it's very telling in these verses. Verses 5 and 6 of 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look at verses 5 and 6. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. In other words, she's talking with God. She's, she's, she's okay, my family's gone. But there's one. There's one who has not left me. There's one who will not leave me. There's one I can go to. I can't go to my children. They're not around. I have a God, and I can talk to Him morning, noon, and night. I can always go to Him. This is one side of the equation. Someone who sets their hope in God. And then it contrasts that in the next verse. Verse 6. But she who is self-indulgent, will you read it with me? Is dead even while she lives. In other words, if instead of seeing what God is offering to you in Himself that is filling and life-giving and energizing and encouraging and grounding, if we seek to, instead of having that as our hope, we find hope in stuff that we can touch and taste and hear and see, that is death to us. It's like taking another run at losing your spouse. It's taking another run at losing your kids. It's taking another run at losing something else. I thought if I could just drown it out with this, I would feel better. And for a moment, for a season, we feel better. But then we come to the end of that moment, that season, and it's like, you've got to be kidding me. This is all I've got? How long am I going to deal with this? That's death. God, on the other hand, offers life, filling life. Last week we talked about the fact that God has placed eternity into our hearts. This inexhaustible need within us that can only be filled by an eternal God. And when He fills it, when He fills that void within us, and we have that settled, I know, I know I have life. I know I have forgiveness. I know I have a foundation. I know I have a place to put, put my feet. And I know where I'm going because God is for me and with me and in me. When that is filled, and then we have a burger, it's like, man, that's really great. I don't need any more out of it. You know, sometimes I go to a, a restaurant and I'm like looking through the menu and I can't figure out what exactly I want and I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to make the bad choice. And I remind myself, look in the mirror, buddy. You're probably going to eat again. <laughs> you ate yesterday. You're probably going to eat again. So just choose one and don't worry about it. Maybe it'll be terrible. You don't have to eat that one ever again. It's going to be okay. When the Lord helps us to see that it's not all about the extracting everything out of this very second, there's something so, so much greater, then I can enjoy eating a good burger or I can kind of complain about a bad chicken parm. Is there such a thing? Probably not. <laughs> Nationwide is on your side. I'm always hoping that one of these times that one of these uh, places is going to hear one of my advertisements for them and send us some advertisement money. At any rate, that which is self-indulgence if in, and left to itself, it will leave us with air burgers. Instead, when we have the solid footing of a God who loves us and has provided for us and filled us, then we can enjoy these little treats in life and say, huh, that was really nice. What's next to do? Whether it's something to accomplish or maybe another experience. Maybe there is another vacation you ought to take. 
There's nothing wrong with taking a vacation. There's nothing wrong with taking two, if you can afford it. There's nothing wrong with that. Just don't think that that vacation will give you ultimate satisfaction and peace and settle all the problems that you had before the vacation. There's only one that settles all those problems. He's a very good God, a very good Father who provides the best gifts that can't be taken from us. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. What a God. So we lead to our last point, and we'll just take just a minute on it. Ultimate pleasure comes as a gift from our always satisfied, joy-filled God. Chew on that for a moment. Ultimate pleasure comes as a gift from an always satisfied, joy-filled God. So you think about this. God as a good gift. He gives good gifts to his children. Matthew talks about that, or Jesus talks about it in Matthew. James talks about the fact that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God gives good gifts, wonderful gifts. There is a day coming, the psalmist talks about it, that we're going to be in the presence of God if we've trusted Christ. We know Christ as our Savior. We've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and God's forgiven our sin and given us righteousness. We're going to spend eternity with God. Listen to how David describes that in Psalm 16 and verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. Listen carefully. In your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is filled with joy. One of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. God fills our lives with joy because our eternity is one that's filled with joy because we'll be in His presence. In Psalm 21, you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Now, I want you to think about all the things that Solomon did. If you were to take some time and look at Revelation 19 and Revelation 21 later on today, or tonight when you come back for our enjoyable study, digging in a little bit more deeply, you would see that God has a banquet prepared for his people. And I would like to ask you if you think that Solomon, with his wildest feast, could compare to a feast prepared by God himself. And the answer you would have to give to that is there's not a chance. The giver always has more than the one who receives the gift. Our giver has inexhaustible resources. So that party is going to be the best party of eternity, right? Solomon, with all these works of his hands, the temple, God talks about a temple he's built for us that's coming. Solomon's temple has not a chance at comparing. A house, not a chance at the one that Jesus has made for you and for me. The, the, the lush fields, the, the, the trees with fruit, all the things that Solomon did, the, the lush grass, nothing, nothing compared to the the. the trees that God has in store for us in heaven. There are pleasures forevermore. But the question I have for you as we, we just have another couple minutes is, do I have to wait until then to experience that pleasure? And the answer is, absolutely not. God gives us in this life little tastes. I call them foretastes. Foretastes of glory divine. Little tastes because God has placed within us His Spirit. And God's Spirit brings into our lives love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and self-control. He fills us. We have this void Filled. Pleasure need? He'll fill your pleasure need with Himself. You know what's interesting? Last comment. 
the end of Psalm 23. Everybody knows Psalm 23. He's the shepherd. He provides. Beautiful. Verse 6. Listen carefully to these words. Listen to them afresh. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know that word follow means to pursue. The same word was used when, when Abraham was pursuing after the people that, that kidnapped his nephew, Lot. Like You think he was determined to go get his nephew, Lot, back? He was pursuing with an absolute hot pursuit. That's the same word that's used here. Surely, God's goodness and God's mercy pursue after us in hot pursuit. After us, how long? All the days of our lives. And after all the days of our lives, not the soap opera, the real thing, we will enjoy Him forever. A God pursuing me with His good gifts instead of me pursuing after every self-indulgence to please myself. God wants to fill me with real goodness and real mercy and real pleasure, not just for one day, but every day for the rest of my life. And then I get to spend eternity with Him? What kind of a God is this? And the answer is, the only one that really exists. And he's here for you. And he offers himself to you. Come to him. And he'll give you life. And he'll give it to you in full abundance. Let's pray together. God, you are so good. You overwhelm our lives with good things. And yet, uh, we experience trauma and turmoil and frustration and sadness and anxiety and distress. Father, help us to see that in those moments of difficulty, you are offering to us everything that we need to meet those challenges and over abundantly exceed anything we could ever ask or think. Help us to come to you recognizing your love has been demonstrated in sending Jesus to lay down his life as a perfect, full, satisfying sacrifice for us that we might have life from you. I pray for anyone here that's never experienced that life that even today they would call upon your name asking you to give them life through Jesus and that you would do that. And I pray for each believer here. Help us to know how to balance these desires for pleasure, knowing that if we'll just let you, you'll give us pleasures uh, that, that are unexplainable. And I pray, Father, you'd help us not to be unwise and, and hoarding, but to enjoy the things that you've already entrusted to us. Help us to enjoy the blessings you've already flooded upon us and not to overlook them. Thank you for the many gifts, but particularly for the greatest gift of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.